Okay. So Dr. Merritt is a historian, writer, and activist based in Atlanta. She earned her bachelor's from Emory and her MA and PhD from UGA, War Eagle. Her first book, Masterless Men, Poor Whites and Slavery in the Antebellum South, um, won the Bennett Wall Award for the Southern Historical Association, honoring the best book in Southern economic or business history published in the previous two years, as well as the President's Book Award for Social Science History Association. Merritt, along with Matthew Hild, is or were editors of Reconsidering Southern Labor History, Race, Class, and Power from the University Press of Florida, which won the 2019 Best Book Award uh, for United Association for Labor Education. She's currently writing the Trade Press book, as well as working on a major documentary project. And the documentary project, I'm trying to find it right here real quick, is actually dealing with the Civil War, if I remember correctly. Please correct me if I'm wrong, um, Dr. Merritt. Uh, she's appeared in the New York Times, CNN, Washington Post, um, the Science Channel, and then elsewhere. She is a scholar of Reconstruction and Labor History, and she has recently been introduced to Lillian Smith and is working on, I think, a project or two about Lillian Smith, and she will be presenting today, Creators of the Dream, Lillian Smith and the Power of Art. Welcome, Dr. Merritt. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Matthew, for having me. Thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, I, you know, throughout all of my schooling, I, uh, throughout being a born and bred Southerner, I never heard of Lillian Smith until, you know, probably five or six years ago. And just to give you a little bit of background about me, I was born in Southern Mississippi, spent most of my life here in the Metro Atlanta, then Atlanta area. And, um, you know, I, I was raised, I like, I like to preface my talks with saying I was raised in a racist family, in a racist culture. And, you know, I went to school with racist textbooks and often racist teachers. I was brought up steeped in the culture of white supremacy. And, you know, for me to get to this point in my life and, and doing the kind of work that I'm doing now was a very long journey that started um, mainly with art. Art was really the first way that, you know, everything that I had been taught as a white Southerner was challenged through art, through, through music, through literature, through visual art. And so I think that as academics, and especially as historians, we completely undervalue um, the, the power of art to really change and, and make society better. And so, like I said, I had never heard of Lillian Smith. I had read, grown up reading everything I could get my hands on by Southern authors. You know, from Faulkner to Flannery O'Connor to Carson McCullers or Neil Hurston, everybody I could get. And I, I never even heard Lillian Smith's name. So, you know, why was that? Why had her voice essentially been lost for all of these years? Well, my, my view on it is that she was written out of history for a reason. She was silenced deliberately by the people in power and the people who control the narrative of our nation's history. And why is that? Well, she, her life does not fit into the narrative of this segregated South, this solid white South, um, this idea that um, any kind of black freedom struggle was only blacks alone. Now, now primarily it was, but there were always whites um, to varying degrees of commitment and to varying degrees of, of you know, being radical about the issues, but there were always whites involved in civil rights movements for blacks, especially in the South. Um, and you know, this history has really been kind of written out of, of what we learn in our textbooks and what we learn in schools. And so Lillian Smith is a great way to kind of uh, bridge that gap, I think, and really show what kind of interracial organizing was going on in the South, even in the 1930s and 40s. As you can see here, um, we have a letter from Walter White, who is the head of the NAACP in 1937, reaching out to Lillian Smith and just you know, really commending her work with the North Georgia Review and act, actually buying subscriptions. If you look at these names, these are some of the biggest, most important uh, black political figures, leaders, you know, at the time. James Weldon Johnson, Langston Hughes, Claude McKay. I mean, these are huge names. He's buying subscriptions from this, you know, little white woman from Georgia uh, in Appalachia. 
and sending these subscriptions to some of the most you know, radical political black figures of, of that generation. And, and I think in some ways, uh, Lillian Smith really shatters the narrative of the white oppressor, right? That all whites are joined together in this, in that racism lifts them up. And you can tell through her own life and through her own writings, you know, what kind of psychological toll racism took on her um, and how she really grappled with this as a white Southerner, particularly um, in a psychological way. And she used art to help her heal, I think, racially and help her heal um, emotionally and psychologically for the sins of her forefathers, you know, for the sins of her foremothers. Um, so literally in the mid-1930s, she and her lifelong partner, Paula Snelling, for those of you who don't know, she was in fact a lesbian and lived with Paula Snelling, her, her partner, her best friend, her, her work companion um, for years and years and years, and basically lived pretty openly as gay um, in this small rural Appalachian town. Um, but, you know, they, she and Paula started publishing this really radical incendiary um, literary magazine, as we see here in the, in the photo. Um, and you know, they featured leftist, progressive whites, and radical black thinkers, even people like Pauli Murray and Paul Robeson. And she joined nearly every single Southern organization seeking to, quote, solve the race problem or the race question. And not only did she join these organizations like CORE, but she pestered and berated them into moving left. Um, so even though these were already pretty uh, liberal, progressive organizations, she was constantly pushing people to the left, um, especially on issues like integration and um, you know, racial equality. So um, there's a great documentary on Lillian Smith's life, and I know there have been screenings there at Piedmont College. I, I would really encourage you guys to watch it. But in that documentary, uh, Brenda Bynum calls Lillian a, quote, braver artist, a braver artist, because she actually imagined and wrote about the inner lives of Black people. And I think this gets to the heart of why her work, Lillian Smith's work, was so different and new for whites. Um, because she put psychology at the center of not only white people, but of black lives. And she, um, you know, from everything from sexuality to motherhood, to masculinity, to relationships, racism, classism, she used psychology to essentially, I think, engender uh, a type of empathy. And doing so, of course, very much bothered all of the powerful elite white men that she seemed to be analyzing. As Ralph McGill, the famous editor of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution for so long, described her in February of 1955, quote, in many respects, Miss Lillian Smith is a modern feminine counterpart of the ancient Hebrew prophets, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, and Micah, who came hot-eyed and accusing out of the deserts, to stand in the marketplaces of their cities crying, woe unto ye who are unrepentant and of little faith, thereby causing many citizens to be sore, anointed and afraid. Um, you know, she was a complete radical in every sense of the word. And even with, uh, again, with these progressive organizations, she was always pushing them to be even more radical. But how is she able to really get away with this, you know, in the South, in the deep South, in a small rural Southern town? Um, and I think it's important to understand that at that time and, and at that place, she was literally, she and Paula Snelling both were literally putting their lives on the line to do this. Um, and how they were able to do this was through the lens of art. And so in addition to being a pioneering anti-racist, Lillian Smith was a wonderful writer mastering multiple genres from articles, short stories, novels, novellas, op-eds, on and on and on. And so she was truly a Renaissance woman um, as a writer. And she continued learning and working on her craft up until you know, the day she died, essentially. And it was through her writing, particularly her novels, like Strange Fruit, that she was able to use art to talk about concepts that were not only forbidden to be discussed in the South, but topics that would literally, you know, get the artists, whether black or white, man or woman, lynched or killed. 
As fellow writer Buckland Moon said of her in a New York Times article in 1949 regarding her magnum opus, Killers of the Dream, it is almost though Lillian Smith were saying, in my first book, I shocked you into seeing what your sins are. And this one, I'm going to try to convert you. And so here she is, of course, with, uh, her partner, Paula Snelling, who was absolutely the love of her life, but was also her intellectual equal and, and truly a partner and especially much of Lillian's earlier work. Um, you know, she served as Lillian's editor, her secretary, her writing partner, basically her caretaker, especially um, through Lillian's battles with breast cancer. And so although Lillian Smith and Paula Snelling were never physically attacked for their uh, roles in being anti-racist, Lillian was the victim of repeated vandalism and theft and even suffered through a terrible arson that destroyed not only her home, but countless, countless irreplaceable letters, books, and novellas. She spent most of her later life, like I said, in a prolonged struggle against breast cancer. I mean, truly uh, going for multiple, multiple surgeries, you know, going for all sorts of different kind of radiation therapies that took so much out of her. And this really did, you know, impede her work in some ways. And it really depressed her because there were times she literally could not devote time to working. And she saw, um, you know, this as her life's work. And so from Martin Luther King, the head of the NAACP, Walter White, to the president and first lady of Morehouse at the time, Benjamin and Sadie Mays, to activists such as A. Philip Randolph, Paul Robeson, Polly Murray, Alice Walker, Mary McLeod Bethune, Lillian Smith not only offered support to Black activists and worked with them to change things, but she also genuinely forged friendships with these people. I mean, the idea that she and Paula, you know, two middle-class white lesbians living in rural Appalachia, would openly hold integrated dinners and have these people come stay at their house with them uh, overnight, have host black guests in their home. That's, that's simply mind blowing when you think back to the you know, 40s and 50s when this was happening. They were literally putting their lives at risk. And I think that fact cannot be overstated. So briefly, I did want to acknowledge, publicly acknowledge that you know, she and Paula, who was at the time always referred to as her, quote, good friend or, quote, constant companion. Um, they essentially lived openly as lesbians during this time. And again, this is as far back as like the 1930s. It's amazing to think about. And I think this in itself gives us pause um, in reconsidering how we see LGBTQ people within Southern history and in, in the South in general, um, because it suggests that at least in some places in the rural South, uh, it was more live and let live and not, you know, running people out of town or, or you know, jailing them for what they're doing. Um, it, it was more live and let live than more punitively um, homophobic. And so I think there's an argument that my friend, the historian Karen Cox from UNC Charlotte makes um, that, you know, the South has always openly recognized that there were gay people, you know, around and we just essentially used euphemisms for what they were. They were the... Um, you know, the uh, single bachelor uncle, or, you know, we have all these euphemisms, but essentially gay people could live um, uh, with their lives being out there. They just had to be careful about how, um, how open their relationships were. So getting back to race though, I wanted to toy with the idea that although Lillian Smith was undoubtedly a pioneering anti-racist, she primarily saw herself as an artist. And she said that time and time again, she wrote about this constantly. Um, she knew, but uh, she knew that art, true art, could never be divorced from lived experience and history and the political. She knew that art has to be political, art is political. And so she never understood when people asked her that question, you know, was she, was she being political or was she really a, just a writer? because those two things could not be uh, dissociated from each other. And, you know, I've had the pleasure now to spend some time there um, at her home in Screamer, on Screamer Mountain. And it's just absolutely remarkable to go and see all of her books, you know, just her extensive, extensive library, literally 
ceiling to floor, wall to wall, just covered with books, every single wall, every single space, you know, with books. And everything, you know, from philosophy, science, history, fiction, uh, but very, very, very heavily um, stacked with psychological books, though. A lot of Freud, a lot of early psychological theory. And she really did use all of this vast knowledge to create some of the best written art in Southern history, I think. Now, in one of her most famous speeches, 10 years from today, and this was a commencement speech at Kentucky State College in 1951, Lillian Smith used art to beautifully and rightly explain the psychological wages of whiteness, to try to explain why whites of all classes clung to segregation and to racism. Quote, this loss of one's old psychic defenses, one's old image of the self, is the price that mankind pays and has always paid for profound cultural change. And this loss is often the cause of violence that that change sometimes brings forth. It is important that we remember also that when a man gives something up, even old defenses, he is not going to feel good unless he is something equal or better returned to him. These are the terms of real and lasting peace, whether it be peace of mind or soul, or peace between nations or classes or races. So this, you know, this is precisely where and how art comes into the picture. Art helps us connect to other human beings, or it makes us sympathetic and empathetic to the plights of other people, other people we know nothing about. Um, and art teaches us how to be in tune with both the emotional and the psychological. Quote, she continued in this famous speech, we must give our people new beliefs, new images of themselves to substitute for the old. We also need new outlets for their frustrations, new and creative outlets. So, so much of the racism and the pain of the South and, and ultimately in America, the pain that we had been dealing with for centuries, she thought, it could in part be blamed on the failure to incorporate art into the fight against racism, into the fight against white supremacists, into the fight against fascists. Quote, the poets, the wise men, the talented were mute, she proclaimed. They withdrew to their ivory towers and let the political demagogues of the world take over the most precious task, the most important to a human being in our time of change, that of giving him new, satisfying images of himself to live by, images created out of words. What a sad and tragic thing this will be in our South if those who are gifted stay silent. And so this was just an absolute indictment of especially all of the white Southern writers at the time from Faulkner, you know, to, to everyone else that she knew um, was that, you know, they, they were these famous writers. They had uh, high public profiles, but yet they were mute when it came to fighting for rights for black people in the South or, or, or saying anything, you know, that challenged uh, white supremacy and racism. So ultimately, I think Lillian Smith uh, showed the sins of the South, but she also held on to hope. And she showed a path forward, not only uh, you know, for, for Black Southerners and Black Americans, but for whites, any potential white ally, any white who had ever struggled with why racism felt bad to him or her, why they thought racism might be wrong, why they didn't believe in white supremacy. So she would scold and she would preach, but she also welcomed back sinners with open arms and a forgiving heart. As she so, so famously wrote, it is a tremendous responsibility, an awesome and fascinating job for our writers and speakers and teachers and leaders to find new words for old, to create new images of ourselves, without which we cannot live sane lives to help men fall in love with new ideals, to find new outlets for the old hates and humiliations. And so as you can see here, she really thinks that art not only helps us heal from the sins of the past, past but, they, but that it also, uh, it's essential 
to any kind of hope, any kind of dreams for the future. We have to use art to be able to convey um, what the future looks like, what we can hope for, what we can think about achieving. And I think that this is so particularly uh, necessary right now in the moment that we're in. You know, we're living through an absolutely historical moment right now a moment of mass death on a scale that none of us have ever seen in our lifetimes. Um, mass death on a scale uh, that borders into, I think in some ways, you know, extremely racist near genocidal proportions for some communities in America. And we have to not only be able to right some of these wrongs that we've been living with the past five years and indeed in the past entire history of America, but you know, we also at the same time have to figure out a path forward. And she always knew that art was going to be the key uh, to that path forward. And to me personally, you know, I'm, I'm a historian, I'm a writer primarily, but right now her work has helped draw me into trying to figure out other ways um, to essentially democratize knowledge to democratize history in this country and getting real history out to the people. And I think that um, a lot of academics and a lot of, you know, the keepers of this kind of knowledge and this, this historical, uh, tr these historical truths, they need to think about using other mediums to reach uh, the American public and to reach even the broader world. And that's why I'm really, I've been drawn into film and I've gotten into some film making lately. And, and my ultimate goal um, with my partner, Raylan Barnes uh, from Princeton, is that we plan to make a new Civil War documentary that will you know, recenter the story of the Civil War, which um, of course, most Americans, and especially most white Americans, when you ask them what they know about the Civil War and what they learned about the Civil War, they always talk about not school, but Ken Burns' Civil War series on PBS. You know, everybody from politicians to, you know, just everyday people, that's, that's what they go back to. That is what formed uh, most of their memories of the Civil War and their ideas about the Civil War. And, you know, that's a 30-year-old film at this point, and no one else has done anything that's come close to that. And so our, you know, most of the ideas today that we have about the Civil War are based on something that's not only 30 years old, but that was not made by historians. That was made by people who are not trained in history. And that if you go back and watch it today, there, it's, it's almost at times sympathetic with Confederates and with white supremacists and traitors to this nation. And so the story needs to be retold and it needs to be retold um, from the perspectives of not just you know, the people and the, the white men in the armies, but um, it, the fact that uh, you know, the enslaved in this country essentially freed themselves. They freed themselves by fighting and by leading the largest labor strike in this country's history. We needed to retell the story about, you know, the indigenous people who are constantly being pushed off their land and the Mexicans who were uh, run out of Texas. And so this is our goal. Um, with the, the Civil War documentary. And I, I think it's, you know, to me, Lillian Smith has really, um, really, really affected the way not only that I think about writing and art and uh, history, but also the way in the ways in which we need to try to get um, history and anti-racist work to the public and art is absolutely essential to that. And I think, especially if you look at this entire panel today, it's, it's so impressive um, that you can really see how all of these different forms and formats and especially, you know, the visual, the visual is so evocative and, and the visual can move you um, at certain times in ways that the written word cannot. Um, and so all of this is needed in order to not only heal from the past, like I said, but to move forward. And so I know um, I'm gonna take some time for questions, but in closing, I wanted to take a moment to just, igno no, just acknowledge um, what an extraordinary time we're living in. You know, make no mistake, it's terrifying, it's horrifying, but you know, it's a time of great uncertainty and great anxiety, but also the flip side to that is that it's 
also an exhilarating time. And this is a time of deep contemplation uh, of historical reckoning and psychological healing. And I think that there are very few periods in history like the one we're living now, where you've got such major, um, major change going on that there's actually a chance to change things. You know, there's actually a chance to, to in insert ourselves into the broader um, you know, narrative of this country with art and really kind of change the direction, um, not only of you know, labor and civil rights, but just you know, the political in this country as well. So it's time, I think, it's high time to turn our outrage, our anger, and our deep disheartening sadness into action. And we've been on the defense, you know, we've been resisting, we've been um, surviving for years now, really. Um, and there are plenty of people that have enough on their plates to do that. But it's time for some of us, and especially the artists in this world, to really step back and meditate and to turn that anger and that frustration and, and, and sadness into passion and really see how and recognize how outrage can be generative and that art can be political. So stop resisting, start creating. And because as Lillian Smith has shown us, you know, art truly has the power to change things. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Merritt. Um, there is Q and A at the bottom. If you actually click down at the bottom, there's a Q and A section down there. So just click on that and you can actually um, ask the question. There was a question, let me fix this, I apologize. I was, I was trying to, to get the share back in the speaking. There was a question, let me see if that's the one that was popped up in here, yeah. And I know the answer to this one, but somebody asked, are you familiar with uh, Dr. Heather Cox Richardson's work on the Civil War and especially you know, how the South won the Civil War and um, her other work? Absolutely, she was actually one of the big influences in me writing Masterless Man, my first book. Um, I know Dr. Richardson well. She is actually on the board of this Civil War documentary. Um, I'm, I'm going to be working with her on a couple of other things, too. I think um, she and I really have the same idea when it comes to the fact that essentially what I say about poor whites in the South in the antebellum period and the fact that you know, I'm not arguing by in any means that they were not racist. They absolutely were racist. But they were racists who didn't necessarily support slavery at times, and they were racists who certainly didn't support the leaders of the Confederacy, or, you know, these were essentially anti-Confederates. Um, and, and so this kind of disillusioned, um, poor white, working class white, she kind of traces that in her new book um, and, and sees what happens with, uh, when you really take this kind of, uh, trying to create a solid white society and trying to maintain um, segregation. She looks at what happens when that, you know, when the South kind of goes West and then the West eventually takes over the rest of America. So she, she in some ways argues for the Southernization of America, which I think is becoming kind of a common theme in a lot of um, history circles right now. But um, I also have an interview with her that I did yeah. right before yeah. the elections. Um, last November, if you go to YouTube and look up meritocracy, and that's with two R's and two T's, um, I have a great interview with her there, and she's just so candid and open um, and, and just, you know, br brilliantly presci prescient. You know, she, many other historians did too, but she was one of the first ones to really call, um, especially one of the only white, white professors to call, you know, what Trump was doing uh, exactly what it was from the beginning. And you mentioned, I was listening to your, to your talk, of course, a second ago, and you mentioned the Civil War documentary about the indigenous, which is an important aspect of that story too, and then also Texas. And reading her book is when I realized that the ones who were defending the Alamo were defending slavery, essentially. Absolutely, um, absolutely. A, a part of a lot of the other things I learned from her book too, but, but that really stuck out to me. Yeah, we have to really start seeing how uh, this country's history is is just so riddled with inequality and violence at every single turn. And there is going to be a lot um, that that we are going to have to reckon with psychologically. And again, a, a way, to, a path forward, a path to healing, a path, uh, 
you know, to get over this is through art. Yeah. And you, you talk a lot in your work too, with masterless men, you know, I see a lot of connections. If, if you have questions, remember to put them in the, in the Q and a, I also changed the chat just to let you know too, to where you can only chat with panelists. We'll still know if the sound's not working. Um, but that way it, it won't get garbled up. That was just me running around trying to get everything straightened up too. But reading your book, Masterless Men, you, you talk about poor whites and Lillian Smith talks about that, talks about poor whites a lot too. And she also has a speech, I think you may have shared it with me, where she says poor whites are not, she's not talking about economically poor whites. She's talking about, um, I guess, spiritually or, you know, consciously poor whites. But can, can you talk about your work a little bit with, with labor in the South and just kind of the discussion of poor whites and, and wealthy whites and other groups? Sure. So um, I, my, my first book, Masterless Men, looked at poor whites who are the people in the antebellum South that did not own uh, slaves and they did not own land. So these were truly cyclically poor people. Um, sometimes, you know, many of them at the point of starvation. And I argue that, you know, I don't obviously compare their plight in any sort of way to the enslaved. Uh, that, that's not a comparison. Um, but I argue that slavery was detrimental to their lives on a socioeconomic level. Um, that, you know, these are, are men who had historically worked in agriculture, especially in the Deep South, as agricultural laborers, as tenants, as sharecroppers, and as uh, the institution of slavery really exploded in the Deep South um, in the 1840s and 50s as cotton prices just, you know, uh, kept skyrocketing. Um, these men, these white men, these poor white men were essentially um, turned out of the labor market because planters would, of course, rather have enslaved labor that they could brutalize and beat and, you know, completely command. And um, because they essentially were, these poor whites were essentially unemployed or underemployed just consistently and, and lived these, and this, you know, cyclical poverty, um, you know, never being educated. There was no system of public education in the South. Um, and, you know, never having jobs. So many of them turned to crime and, and stealing and trading with the enslaved. Um, and so they were constantly in and out of jails and prisons. And, um, you know, there was kind of a carceral state created to um, police poor whites, especially their actions with, with Black people, whether free Black or enslaved. Um, and so they were really kind of the bottom of society, um, uh, of white society in, uh, in the antebellum times. And I, my ultimate argument is that they were not Confederate supporters. You know, they were the people who, uh, first of all, didn't really understand what was going on at a national level. You know, many, of, many, most of them were illiterate. They didn't understand. They didn't know what was going on. And so when, you know, these big, you know, incredibly, incredibly rich um, Confederates, you know, lead them into secession and try to make them sign up uh, and fight for the Confederacy, they don't do it. They're anti-Confederates. It's not that they're unionists because they don't even know enough to be unionists, most, most of them, but they don't want to fight for the rights of slaveholders. They don't want to go fight and die for slaveholders. And um, my ultimate argument is that they don't enlist until there's a conscription act in 1862. And once there's a conscription act and they start, you know, funneling all these poor whites into the Confederate army, that's when you have mass desertion. And they all, you know, just turn, run back home. And that's essentially a big part of the reason that the Confederacy loses is that they don't have poor whites um, fighting and, and making up the bulk of their armies. Thank you. Do we have any other questions right now? I will tell you while I'm waiting for you to type questions. Um, we do have giveaways here for, for in-person and I went ahead and did this one since, since Dr. Merritt doesn't have a, and she's virtual, I went ahead and did this giveaway for the virtual attendees and I did it while, while she was starting to answer the question. So congratulations to, uh, congratulations to Dr. Lillian Reeves, who's actually here at Piedmont. Um, Probably not, probably not at this today, but her number was drawn out of the out of the individuals who were here. So I'll get in touch with with both of you to to get you a copy of of uh, Dr. Merritt's book. But let me see if there are any other questions that y'all have right now. Um, yeah, I didn't tell anybody beforehand, and I was like, maybe I should do it virtually. So 
Um, and I just did a random, I can show you my, my phone if you want to see the random number generator. <laughs> just so you know, there was no nepotism involved. Um, but what other questions do you have? I don't see any other questions popping up. You know, the, there are a couple of things. Thank you all of you for, for coming. And I, I do want to say this. I know she's not talking here, but but Paula Snelling's great niece is actually on the on the call too. Um, and I've had the chance to speak with her and hopefully the chance to speak with her again later. But she's actually um, Skyping in or Zooming in as well. We have a question from Dean Cress, who says, almost all of my, or maybe a comment, almost all my Southern ancestors were illiterate, poor non-slaveholders, some of whom were Alabama uh, unionists. And I've tried to read all I can, all I can find on their thinking about race. Can you comment on differences in views of poor white men versus women? We honestly uh, don't have enough uh, information to really comment on views per se, um, especially in the antebellum period, even really throughout the entire 19th century. You know, most of these poor whites are not really educated until after the New Deal. Um, and even then, you know, my own grandmother um, had a sixth, a sixth grade education, you know, because uh, she would have to drop out and go work in the cotton mills or picking cotton. Um, so we don't have written records left over from them. I would recommend the work of Victoria Bynum, B-Y-N-U-M. She um, is an amazing scholar of poor white women and uses a lot of court records to, uh, to really show, uh, you know, get into what their daily lives were like and um, argues that in a lot of ways, poor white women's sexuality was a huge, um, nuisance and, and really almost a political problem for the planter elite because poor, you know, at the time under slavery laws, the, uh, the status of babies, whether or not they were free or enslaved, depended on the race of the mother. So poor white women, if they had relationships with black men, which they did all the time, um, they basically had, um, you know, had the capacity to uh, to create an entire race of free blacks in the South. And that really, really scared planters because they, they really tried to keep it where there are very, very few free blacks in the deep South and outside of Louisiana and Charleston. Uh, they wanted um, you know, there to be a clear delineation between white and free and black and slave. And by the time of the 1840s and 50s, I argue, there's actually so much um, racial mixing in the South um, that it is very, very hard to determine certain people's race. And there, you, I mean, I've read every major court case that deals with this and there are hundreds, if not thousands of them um, where they're trying to determine a person's race. And honestly, what it usually comes down to is, is their class. Um, and if they're high class, you know, tax paying citizens, they're deemed white. And if they're poor, a lot of times they're, they're you know, uh, deemed black or even enslaved. Um, but it's a, it's a really interesting dynamic. Poor whites, uh, especially in the 19th century, tended not to have uh, being married. They, they did not get married in any kind of state or even in a church. So they had these short-term relationships, um, would often have children, um, you know, by multiple, have multiple fathers for their children. Uh, it was a very unstable situation and, and poor white women led households a lot of the time because poor white men had to travel around constantly in search of, you know, short-term day labor, essentially. We have one more question from... You tell about the court cases, Marie? We have a question from, from in here. So the court cases are in her book she talks about in Masterless Men. Yeah, and, and there's also um, an entire collection of basically every single case involving slavery or race. Um, it, it's like a five volume um, thing. It's called, uh, the, the editor of it is, I think her name is Lillian. I think her first name is Lillian, but it's Catherall. Catherall, if you look up Catherall and, um, and Antebellum Slavery, um, you'll find the, the five volume that, that literally has almost every single um, case involving slavery or race in it. So, so there are two more things real quick. Let me get to Barbara's real quick too, because there is the discussion and 
and Judas and the Black Messiah with Fred Hampton bringing groups together. And of course, that's one of the things you argue is, and that, and that Lillian Smith argues that the fear is of groups coming together. I mean, that's one of the fears of, um, even during the revolution of Native American, uh, indigenous and African free people of color coming together. Um, remember Crispus Attucks is, is indigenous and, and black. Um, and he's the first one who's killed during the revolution. So that, that's a threat, I think. I mean, that's part of King as well. Um, and do you want to add anything, anything to that? I mean, there's a long history there that we could look at. There, there is absolutely a long history. Um, it, it starts not only in the antebellum uh, network of trade um, between enslaved blacks and poor whites, um, where they were constantly like poor whites would usually trade liquor or clothing or things that um, black enslaved people didn't have access to. And then the black people would trade, you know, crops that they've appropriated, you know, that they've raised. And, and um, so there was a whole underground network that planters were constantly trying to st stamp out. Early reconstruction is another a great period to look at where it's literally a coalition for the first few years in these deep south states of, uh, of black people with black leaders. Um, and, but the rank and file uh, also included a lot of poor whites. Um, populism. Populism was a biracial coalition. You know, we even had a biracial, uh, you know, we had biracial um, city governments and things like that in the South during then. And also even the 30s and 40s uh, as uh, communism and socialism swept through certain parts of the South. Um, we saw this again. It's always, always been, um, you know, a multiracial uh, struggle for civil rights. Now, again, white people certainly make up a small minority of people involved in that struggle, but it's always been uh, something that the white elite absolutely fear. And that is exactly why they stoke racism and hatred whenever they can um, to try to keep poor and working class whites from um, associating with people that they're more, you know, have more in common with on an economic level. And the last question we have before we before we break for lunch, I apologize about the lighting with me too. I'm in the back, but so so Lillian Reeves writes um, every time I see her name too and talk to her, I think of Lil, FYI. But she says I'm interested in hearing more about how artists involved in this type of work, democratizing history, uh, find each other and work together to magnify their work. Um, could you and Chuck and Chuck's outside right now, for instance, find each other if you weren't brought together in this space? Um, what suggestions do you have for other artists or writers who want to build community around trying to bring uh, volume to these histories? So how do you find people, basically? So I find people through Twitter. And Twitter has yep. been, like, honestly, the best thing for my career that I've ever done. Um, because it really has expanded my my view, my, my, the people that I can connect with, you know, I can connect with anybody in the entire planet, you know, through, through Twitter, I can see their work. We can you know, just reach out through a DM and collaborate. And I have made so many, not only amazing friends, um, but colleagues and every, literally everybody I'm working with right now um, on the documentary, anybody that I've co-written anything with in, in the last, you know, five years, uh, even meeting Matthew, you know, that it was all through Twitter. And I think it's, it's more than just an intellectual community. It really is a good community for artists. And it's a great, a great way for um, people of, of, of different, you know, genres basically to, to find each other and, and figure out how to collaborate. But that's a great question. I mean, I would, I, I'm not young enough to know all this. <laughs> the uh, hot new things that are out, I, you know, I'm not on Clubhouse necessarily or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. But for me personally, um, Twitter has been a godsend of helping me connect to other activists and um, artists. And I would, I would second that. I mean, that's, I was really late to kind of get into, into Twitter, but actually getting into Twitter was, was what connected me with Carrie, with Chuck. Um, with different people at different places. So that's a great way to do it, social media. I'm not sure about Instagram much. I know you're on Instagram. Facebook is not the best way to do that um, for these type of connections, but Twitter definitely. I see that Rose Gladney typed something, but I'm not sure if she has a question.
I'll give it just a second. We will break for lunch, um, like I said, and we'll be back at one o'clock. What I'll do is I'll actually put Show Baraka slideshow on since she's the one that's coming um, at one o'clock. And I'll just, I'll just have it on loop. It's just a 15 minute music loop, just to let you know. Hopefully we have the microphone fixed. We will see when he gets here, um, when, he, when he talks. If not, let me know. You can still um, type in the chat. It'll just go to the participant. It'll just go to us as the panelists and not to the participants. So I'll see it and I'll know and I'll work on it. I sincerely apologize, like I said before. Thank you for bearing with us and thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, oh, yeah, so Rose asked about, about the openness of sexual relationships with, with Paula and, and Lillian. Um, because they did burn the letters, of course. Um, don't remember if Paula or if they both burned them. She she knows that. I I will say this. Um, Sue's, who is Paula's great niece, if she wants to type in the questions here too, said that she has letters between um, Paula and Lillian too that weren't burnt. Um, which I'm not sure what those had. I think she just she just got those. So a whole nother discussion. We have to have two, and, and Rose would be great to talk to talk with th with these. I, I was going to say I defer to anything she says. She has done way more research than I have. I was referring mainly to a lot of the letters I've been reading lately from people that went to stay with them, you know, and very much talked to you know. It, whenever there are letters written to Lillian Smith, it always yeah. was like, "How's Paula? We're thinking of you guys." It, it treated them very much as a couple. We can't wait to come up and stay with the two of you. You know, if you read it today, it's uh, it, yeah, you're not saying, you know, how's your partner, how's your lover, but, you know, it's, it's kind of that understated Southern way of, of recognizing something without really saying it. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, too, I've seen that too. Um, if you have not read Rose Gladney's work, read it. She is, she is the, the scholar and the woman who has, who has brought, you know, Lillian, really to me, I mean, apart from, apart from this position, but but reading what she's had to say and what she discovered. I mean, she interviewed Paula, she interviewed Camper, she interviewed family members, all of her work, especially the collection of letters, How Am I To Be Heard, um, the book that she did, the reader with Lisa Hodgins here at Piedmont, uh, Lisa's retired, but definitely, definitely find her work and read. And we have her on the podcast. Um, her work has been indispensable for me in trying to research um, this book. And I just really, really want to thank her and tell her how much I appreciate. I mean, I know I've seen the volumes, you know, I haven't gone through all of the records that she's, I mean, literally it had to have taken her years to go through all these records. Um, so she has really done you know, put in the hard work for, for future historians to really understand Lillian Smith. Okay. Yeah, the, Rose was adding too. Um, I could I could bring Rose in, but I know we got to wrap up. But but she just said um, she doesn't think they live publicly um, open in the way that, that Dr. Merritt's suggesting. This could be a conversation we can have for another panel too. Maybe a good thing down the road. Um that understated way is part of hiding that almost all gay people use um, and still use today. So if we if we had, we will hopefully open this type of conversation up um, at another time because this is this is something that we need to that we need to talk about because that is one aspect, of course, of of Lil's life and and Paula's life that that there's been work done on, but of course, not much public facing work, at least to my knowledge, in the, in this regard. And that's something we, that we need. So thank you. Like I said, I'll, I'll put the, the music on loop and we'll see you back here at one.